All right. So today we're going to be review some of the periodic reports in USAS. We'll be going back and forth from the PowerPoint to the demo instance to give you, sometimes on the PowerPoint, I can give you three screenshots of three different reports at once. So that's why I would be doing that. Um, this is recorded. So you'll find it here. Here's the PowerPoint that we'll be using today. And we'll put the recording out there at the end of today. All right. So today we're going to give you more of an in-depth look at some of these reports that you only get questions periodically because they're only run periodically. So this is a sample district budgetary timeline that I saved from an old article from the OASBO School Business Officials Quarterly Magazine. And it, this was back in June, 2021, but I saved it because I liked the timeline and I thought I'd share it with you. It was an article about appropriations and budgeting, establishing a framework for success, but I strictly took it for the, the timeline. It was written by a past or current treasurer, Dan Romano III and Eric Soltis. But this gives you an idea what the treasurers are going to be doing, you know, throughout the fiscal year. Since we're at the beginning of the new fiscal year, we're gonna start with July, but we're also gonna to touch on what we just went through in June because it all kind of ties together. And then we'll go through the rest of the periodic reports. So, like I said, the two things that are important at the beginning of the fiscal year are treasurers of the school districts must certify their beginning available fund balances to their county auditor and this they do with the certificate of total amounts from all sources. And so we'll go over that. After they know what their resources or revenues are, school districts must also adopt appropriation resolution um, permanently by October 1st. So it was by October 1st. So usually they do it in the September board meeting. Um, but they... If they're going to delay their appropriations, they must at least do the temporary appropriations for fiscal 25 in their June board meeting because your appropri appropriation resolution must be in place before the district spends any money. So that's why we're going to kind of lump these two, but start with July. Any questions, please feel free to um, ask or send a chat. Oops. All right, so starting with the certificate of available balances, this is typically done around July. It is required by the ORC code 5705.36. And on the report, which I'll point out when we go into USAS, the official report title is actually the certificate of total amount from all sources available for expenditures and balances. Um, and this is usually submitted on or about the beginning of the fiscal year to the county auditor, certifying the amount that you have for certifying your, your monies, your revenues, your resources that are available for expenditures for the new year from each fund. And it also includes the unencumbered balances that existed at the end of the previous fiscal year in this case, fiscal year 24. So let's go into USAS. You find these under the periodic menu under certification reports. Um, this report is generated, let me take a sip. This report is generated on the fiscal year that is current. So if I ran this right now with my current period of June, I'm gonna get last year's. 
and I want to certify my funds for the new fiscal year. So I don't necessarily have to have July open. It could be closed. The important thing is to make July current for the report because when you're Posting periods are current. Those are the figures that are coming from the accounts and reflecting on the reports. So we have this as current. It's reflected up here. So now when I run to the run the certification reports, it'll be for July or fiscal year 25. So you have these are the two options for what I'm talking about right now, the beginning of the fiscal year, a summary, summary report and a detail report. I'll give you an example of both, just to see the difference. So this is the summary. It just breaks out the summary lines per fund type. And we're gonna talk about this report. I just wanted to show you the difference. This is the detail. So it's still split out by fund type, but there's split out in much more detail. So we'll talk about both. Um, but first we gotta talk about how I should have left that up, how those accounts are designated to be on that report. So that goes back to the, the accounts. So under the account grid and the cash accounts, we'll take a look at 001, the general fund. When you want a certain fund to be included in the certificate, one would check mark this. If you don't want it included, you would uncheck it. And briefly, I showed you those, the two differences between the reports and noted the fund type. That is also um, defined on the cash record. You have options here, but since this is 001, it's general fund and it is included in the certificate. So now we have the general fund being on the certificate, but how do you want your report to look? And sometimes that is designated by district preferences or county preferences. And it's does it's the reporting levels are defined on the fund. So the entire general fund is gonna be this is gonna to default to fund being reported as fund special cost center. The user does have the ability to modify it to just reporting fund, but it's gonna to default to this. So that's gonna be reported by fund special cost center. And let me show you an example. So this is um, the report when it is set for re the reporting levels to be at fund special cost center. And you can see it's all split out in detail. And this is by fund, same total 13,536. It's just the level of detail that either your county auditor might um, prefer it one way, the district might prefer it one way. I don't know, but there's, you know, the option for that. All right, so let's go back to the report. The menu options are the same for the summary versus the detail. Here, um, you have the ability to exclude a fund special cost center if it's applicable. Treasurers would know whether or not they would need to exclude their funds or not. We would not, you would not. 
Um, and you see the little tool tip that popped up. Um, principal amounts for permanent funds. There's the um, tool tip that says any amount entered here would be subtracted from your July 1st cash balance. Because again, this reports certifying your available cash balance. So you would enter your fund, special cost center, and your principal amount. And the reason why you subtract your principal amount is because the principal amount in your um, funds can't be used for expenditures. So you're taking that out of your availability of for expenditures because you can only use interest from principal amounts for expenditures. You can't use the permanent, um, you can't use the principal amounts, excuse me, only the interest amounts. And then you have the option to um, account for your advances not repaid at the beginning of the year. So you would show, um, you would add amount here for the fund that gave the advance because the account is going to receive it back. And you're going to subtract the amount that still owes because those funds are not available to spend since they'll be paid back. So they're not available for expenditure. So you're going to subtract it out of that fund and add it to the fund that would have the money coming in and be available for spending. The show report options defaults to being checked. You can uncheck it if you want, but this is where all your information would be reported on the report by leaving it checked. And the default is, the default print format is a PDF. So when you generate it, You can see um, here's the advance is not paid. Now I didn't enter anything, so there's nothing there, but that detail would be there if I had. All right, so here's a sample re full report. Notice that official name in USAS, it's called Certificate of Available Balances Detail Report, but when it's printed, it's this. The, the ORC is on there because I believe school districts give this report to their county auditor along with the certification signatures. And you notice again, the fund type split out, which was defined um, under the account grid. So now we're gonna talk about these individual columns. You got your fund type split out, your cash balance as of June 30th. You can get that balance from your um, cash summary report with the current period as of June. So that's your June cash balance on the cash summary report for June. Your encumbrances as of June 2024, that can be found on the purchase order reports, the encumbrances for June or your budget summary for June. And those two should in fact balance. So you could get that number that matches between the PO report or like the cash summary or budget summary from there. This is entered by the user. And then this column minus that equals what is carried over from fiscal year 24, ready to be used in fiscal 25. So then we have the total amount from all sources available from expenditures. Now that came from your available um, what am I trying to say? Your estimated resources. So your anticipated revenues that you predicted for the fiscal year. 
25. So your carryover from fiscal year 24 plus your fiscal year 25 anticipated revenues leave this as the total amount available for the new fiscal year to be budgeted and spent. Any questions on that? Now, if this column happens to be blank or zero, I mean, one of the things that you could troubleshoot is um, did the district apply their proposed amounts to the accounts for fiscal year 25? If they did not, these would be zero because they're pulling it from the accounts. Um, there was something else I was gonna. If one of your accounts is not showing on this report, again, I would go back to the account grid to make sure that that fund or cash account is to be included in the certificate. Again, from the account grid to the specific specific fund. So with this report, the districts takes this along with um, like a PDF with the signatures. I have an example here. Oh, here's an example. So here's what I just showed you, but just for the general fund. It was ran with current July. This is the certificate that we were just looking at. Here's the cash summary report for June. And notice these numbers at the end of June matches the report that I we just ran. I cut off the encumbrances, but you would find the encumbrances on this June report too. And then your current year anticipated revenues is you're coming from your revenue account and listed under the receivable for the year. So let me actually go into that and I'll show you. Nine two two zero. So, oops. So here's your fiscal year to date receivable. And if you happen to pull, oops. You can see the 170 is the, the fiscal year 25 receivable on the account. And here's that screenshot that I got on the PowerPoint. And you can, um, I forgot to mention this. When you're checking for whether it's supposed to be included in the certificate or the way it's supposed to be reported, you can pull those things in with the more button like I did here. It's how it's being reported. And then on the fund grid, I pulled in whether it's supposed to be included in the certificate re um, reporting. But I actually did that by pulling it in from the more button. All right, so you have your report. And now you submit that with the PDF with your signatures and the signatures includes the date, the time, the location, and the signature lines for the county auditor. So if we, I provided it here, and it's also in the documentation. Let me pull it up. Here's a sample of what it says. Um, it could be customizable to the district. Again, here's that official title, the ORC code. And then notice this certification actually has those column ex explanations, the cash balance as of June 30th, the outstanding encumbrances, the advances not repaid. So you're certifying and explaining here 
what that report meant. And then the fiscal officer, the treasurer would sign as well as the county auditor. Any questions? So that is the original certificate at the beginning of the year, but as your anticipated revenues change and your resources um, might be increased for whatever reason, the district can amend the official certificate of estimated resources. And that's usually done later in the year. So if it's in September that you realize you're gonna get more revenues and you wanna amend the official certificate, because your USAS application is currently in September, it's gonna be based on that fiscal year. So like when you we did the official cer certificate, we had to be in July, so it'd be fiscal year 25. Um, same with the amended. You're going to already be in fiscal year 25, so that's fine. And like the certificate, the reporting levels may be different. It's going to default to the fund special cost center, but maybe change to just the reporting level of fund. And we'll go back into the USAS, but here is um, where we chose the, the official, the two. Now we're gonna be looking at the first two. So let's go back to the USAS application. And this is what I mean. We just talked about these. So now we're gonna talk about the amended, even though I started with July, but we might as well touch on this. Now notice, it kind of looks the same. You exclude the fund, your principal amounts and advances, that's your official. Your amended does change because you can, you have the option of how you want your taxes to be reported. So if you check mark these, um, they'll be included in the tax column. Oh, I'm sorry. The taxes or the values in your accounts are going to default in the tax column unless you check mark these and then they'll be in the other column. And I'll show you those columns in a minute uh, when we generate this report. Again, you can exclude funds if needed. You account for your advances not paid and then your principal amounts you would subtract out here or you, I'm sorry, you would enter them, but the report automatically subtracts them from your cash balance, and then you would generate it. I think I did the summary. Let me do the detail. So this is the amended. I guess I'm still in July, but Notice the columns kind of changed because before it was the cash balance on the um, official certificate, it had a column cash balance as of June 30th. During the year when you go to amend it, it's gonna be the unencumbered balance as of July 1st. Now those two are gonna match and I believe I have a screenshot here. Here's the certificate, here's the amended, those two columns are the same amount because what you had available to carry over is gonna be your unencumbered balance as of July. Um, oh, and then this was, if you check mark those, these, it would be in this column. Right now it's defaulting to the other sources. And notice this is the same amount as we had for the anticipated revenues on the official ones. 
So that's later in the year, but going back to like June, July-ish, we have our revenues defined, what we anticipate we're gonna get for fiscal year 25. And now the Board of Education can approve a preparation resolution, a budget that includes each fund and what's appropriated for each fund. And this has to be done before the district can spend monies as of July 1st. So usually this happens like in the June board meeting. And the permanent appropriation resolution is due by October 1st, but a lot of times boards will um, postpone that and just approve a temporary appropriation just so that the district can spend monies and do payroll as of July 1st. Um, and then amend, basically amend it and file the permanent appropriations taking into account what was in your temporary. So your temporary appropriation resolution should be approved before July 1st so that the district can spend the monies. And the appropriation, pro, appropriation resolution those amounts cannot exceed the amount that we, on the certificate, the, the report that we just defined our revenues. Now our expenditures shouldn't be budgeted or appropriated to exceed those, so it can't. I can show you this in the system, but the you can define your reporting levels for the appropriation resolution. And you can see it's check marked here. I also had pulled it into the grid, include in resolution for easy access. And the resolutions levels are going to default to this in order. It's going to report by fund, then fund special cost. It's going to go to um, one digit function, two digit function, and then one digit object for each fund. However, those can be modified per the district. And Besides that, on the cash account, it's going to also go by, again, that fund type. So I'll show you that in a moment where that's defined on the report. But a troubleshooting tip would be if your district says, why is a certain particular fund not on my appropriation resolution? You can check the fund type if this is missing. Um, it would not be on the report. And you can also check the fund to make sure that it's supposed to be included in the resolution. The, if you're running the temporary appropriation, those amounts are coming from your next year proposed amounts on the accounts and your permanents are coming from your current fiscal year figures. So you have a couple options here when you go to the menu and the user has the ability to select the fiscal year here. So it doesn't matter what posting period we're in at all because on this report, you're gonna define the fiscal year that you want on this report. But they're gonna have to think too, because if you do 2024, because say we're in June, we're pretending we're in June, so it, it probably would default to 24, and you run it for beginning balance, you're gonna get 2024 beginning balance when you really want the appropriations for 2025 fiscal year. So, and you have four ways to run this report, beginning balance only, next year proposed, 
and the next year propose. And we'll go through this and give you an example. But you would want 2024 here for the next year proposed. Because if you did 2025, next year proposed would be fiscal year 2026. And then the other ones are your fiscal year to date appropriation, your carryover, and your totals. And then this one would be minus the carryover encumbrances. And then the show default and the PDF format are both defaults, but may be changed. So let's go to the beginning balance. We're going to do it for fiscal year 25 and generate that. This report is only going to give you the beginning balance. Oops, I only have the general fund on this, but the beginning balance was, um, I'm not sure if that looked right or if I'm confusing my, I'm probably confusing my revenue number in my head, but that's your beginning balance for the fiscal year for the general fund. This is the end of the report. The recap above is how Sorry for the scroll. Remember those reporting levels where it was defined by the fund and then fund special cost center, then one digit function, then two digit function, and then I believe it was one digit object. So that's what this was referring to. your resolutions, funds. That's how it's all set up on this report. The next option, you could run it for next year proposed. I think I have Oh, the slide, I gave you a report that you could run just as an example. Your beginning balance on that report that we just saw, we ran it like this. And if you ran this SSDT report, you would see that it would balance. The next year proposed, I would make it 2024, choose next year proposed, I would get that column on the report. Notice we're in fiscal year 24, or the, we, we defined it for fiscal year 24 for the next year proposed for fiscal year 25. Then I took, and I'm just showing you different ways or different reports where you could tie it all together because there's different ways and different reports that you can tie it together. So here I took the budget summary, budget summary report and customized it to only include one column the next year proposed when I was in June and it matches. And then the third option here, sorry, appropriation carryover and totals. We would choose 2025 because the carryover would be fiscal year 24. And the report's gonna show the current appropriations, which is the beginning balance and possibly the adjustments later in the year, the prior year carryover, which again, if you remember that, that was on a cash summary in one of the prior slides, and then your total. So this plus your carryover equals your appropriations. You can also generate it by the next option minus the carryover. 
minus carryover encumbrance. Again, you would do 2025. This is what your report would be. Well, I'll run that because I think I screenshotted it smaller. This is gonna show you the current appropriations, the beginning balance, your carryover, and then your total appropriation. And here I ran that other report, SSDT appropriations and receivables by cash account, just to verify the amount, just an optional report that you can utilize or the districts can utilize. So let's go in just for these two. So here's the third one. Give you a bigger picture of the So here's that screenshot that I took. So basically, the uh, appropriations, your carryover equals your fiscal year 25 appropriations. Then if you generated it minus carryover, I'll show you how what that looks like. It's only going to give you that column which is, if I can do this. So remember, we just ran this report that included the carryover. So this is the total, but this is the, oh, I pulled the wrong one, didn't I? At the beginning balance. Okay, so th this was the previous one that we ran, and this is the, the one minus appropriations. So you see the 2626458. Sorry, that's a certificate again. Well, You can see here versus here. So this is with the carryover and this is without. Sorry if I made that confusing. Please let me know if you have any questions. So this appropriation resolution gets adopted by the Board of Education they date it the time it or time it, put the time down and the location. And I gave you the clickable link for the PDF that could be customized for the district. And it can be found in the documentation as well under this chapter. But I do have an example. So again, the ORC, the temporary or permanent, depending on what they're approving, the board members, their vote. And then I am not sure if you ever heard of a 412 certificate. When I heard that once, I did not know what they were talking about. Had they said appropriation resolution signature page, I would have known. But the 412 certificate is actually a signature page on the appropriation resolution, and it's based on the ORC 412. Who knew? But so I thought I'd share that. Maybe it's common knowledge. Maybe it was just my naiveness that I didn't know. But that's if you ever hear that, that's where it's coming from. The appropriation resolution certificate signature page where the treasurer, the superintendent, and the President Board of Education approves the budget. So that's your revenues and your budgets, appropriations. So then we talk about another periodic report, which is filed um, twice annually once in November, once in May. And this helps like ODE determine if the district has a potential to incur a deficit. It 
is required by, of course, the ORC code um, to submit it. And it includes three years of historical data, five years of projections, and a summary of what, what assumptions you had when making those five years forecast. So I gave you a screenshot here. I'm going to be demoing as we're in fiscal year 24 because I didn't update for fiscal year 25. So when we get into the system, it'll be the last three years and then fiscal year 24 forecasted forward. And the five-year forecast is actually like defined in the EMIS manual section 7.2, so I put the link there. And then let me go into USAS because there's a box on the cash account that would be checkmarked to be included in the general, like general fund, which is the funds that are normally reported on the five-year forecast. Now, USAS has this application has a mandatory rule behind the scenes that automatically assumes that fund 001, I don't have it here, but fund 016 and 002 special cost center 8001. I think I have that on the screen. Yeah. And then any other 002 funds that should be included must be check marked on the cash account to be included. And the mandatory rule is here, but you can't change it. It's mandatory. Nobody can change it but the developers. So let me show you how you can check mark that on the cash account if you had a had one. And I did pull that column into my grid, I believe. Oh, I guess I did not. So this is where it would be include in general. And of course the general fund would be marked. The five year forecast lines are gonna be defined on the expenditure and revenue lines. So I actually pulled in this from the more button to show you the the wages, the benefits, and so forth based on the accounts. I believe I did that with the revenue grid showing the five-year forecast line number. But going to the periodic menu and the five-year forecast, this grid contains the forecast line number the description of the line, both of that together, the count number, three years history, two years, one year, the percent, and the current year. You have, the user has two ways to generate this, CSV and Excel. The CSV is gonna only give you the forecast numbers, um, the prior year, and the current year. So it's gonna have only like three columns. The Excel, when you generate it by Excel, it's gonna, there's gonna be a tab and let me pull it up. I already have it pulled. I clicked on that and generated it. The forecast tab is gonna populate your numbers for the current year. Um, Here's your data. I mean, there's different tabs, but this is the one that's going to be formatted and used in the when reporting it to ODE. So I think this is highlighted to talk about later because the spending plan that we'll talk about later also is like the report is defined by five year forecast numbers. So I believe I highlighted that to be used later. So we'll come back to that. 
So this is what it would pull in from your accounts and then the user would project forward and fill in those amounts and then base their assumptions or def write up their assumptions of how they came up with those numbers. We do have a report that might be useful. It's called the SSDT Financial Report by Forecast Line Number. You have the ability to sort by object number. Oh, shoot. I'm in July. I'm going to go make the... I was pretending I was in fiscal year 24 because I don't have forecast data for 25. So I'm just going to make June current, which makes my accounts and reports to be as of June. And then... SSDT financial report by forecast line number. I'm just going to generate it as is. So you see that by line number, by in each account, you can get the detail from the current year, one year ago, two years to kind of We'll get to get the detail off of what you see here. So there's 395, 3 million 21, 3 million 21. What makes up these numbers? Well, you can run that report and see that those two accounts make up the current year revenue in that forecast line. All right, so any questions on the five year forecast line? Uh, five year forecast. I don't know. I think I showed you this on the grid, but the expenditure accounts and revenue accounts actually have that on the account. And the numbers that are pooling in are from the expendable amount and the receivable amount. Here's the grid that I showed you, the different formats, that report that I talked about. And so now we're going to talk about the spending plan. This actually gives the user a way to estimate their monthly costs or monthly spending plan for the 12 months based on the five-year forecast. So... And then they can, by running different reports, they'll have the ability to like look at their estimated and actual amounts. Now each monthly amount could have a negative amount and I'll show you how we create one in a moment. But this is a good, this is a good screenshot. Remember that line I highlighted 395? We're gonna take that and I'll go into the system in a minute. But basically, um, forecast this amount monthly. Now, I did it pretty evenly. That's up to the treasurer. But that's how you're going to estimate your spending plan and then compare it with your actual. So let me go into the system. And I'll show you because I actually had one set up. To set it up, you'd go to the periodic spending plan. This is all the ones that I have set up per line number. So let's look at that one that was on that PowerPoint screenshot, which was that 395,000. So, well, actually, let me create one and I'll show you. You would pull, is that the line number?
Yeah, it's not going to let me do another one. But anyway, this is what it looks like when you create it. You choose your line number. This would populate with this number. And then, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. When you create, this is where it comes to. You choose your line number and then you start populating your numbers. And then this changes. See what I mean? You could actually have a negative cash flow here or whatever. But this estimate would eventually match what was on your fiscal year or five year forecast. Let me pull that up again, make it smaller. So you're taking that number, 1.04, and predicting your estimates. So that's got to be set up first before any of the reports would be beneficial. So let's look at some of the reports. I have defined them all down to line 801. Um, this is my carryover. If you, I don't remember what these last numbers were, but I remember 251 was my carryover from, or carryover encumbrances from last year. So once I have my estimates set in this screen under the periodic menu, there are a few reports that I've already saved to my home menu. That is called the spending plan comparison, the spending plan monthly, and the spending plan summary. The spending plan comparison is gonna pull your estimated figures, the ones that we just set up, and compare it with your actual amount. So let me actually generate that. Oops. You do have to define the fiscal year. And then the spending plan comparison is actually going to show, like I said, the comparison between your estimated, that 395 on that line, versus what the actual has been for the fiscal year 24. So this is fiscal year, and it's also by month. So here's my estimates that I entered pretty evenly on that, under that spending plan menu. And here are my actuals, and below is my difference. So that's very helpful. Another report would be the spending plan monthly. This is going to list each monthly actual amount for each line number. Again, you got to enter your fiscal year that you want. And when this is generated, that same account is gonna show you the actual for each month, which 348, 238, 348, 238. So that's how those those two reports are compared, I guess. And then the spending plan summary. This will generate the current period's actual amount for each five-year forecast line number and then include a fiscal year to date total for each five-year forecast line number and the difference. Now here is a different menu option for the spending plan summary. Excuse me. So if I want the fiscal year 24 and I only want July totals, I would generate this. Now being only one month into the fiscal year, you would expect that your July totals would be your fiscal year to date totals. 
So, oops, I'm sorry. Your monthly actual for July, because you chose the seventh month, is the same as your fiscal year. And you see the monthly estimate, actual difference. Fiscal year estimate, fiscal year actual, fiscal year difference. But I wanted to show you this because I'm gonna run another report and instead of choosing seven, beginning month of seven, ending month of seven, I'm gonna do July and August, still in 2024. And these parameters, this is what it's gonna be. It's gonna be pulled in for that fiscal year. And then the month, um, The this is gonna be the range. So July to August. So let me run that and I'll show you. So, Maybe I did this in 2000. I had an example in here, I believe. Here's my estimates. I did provide the links, which will give you like a description and a sample look of it, like I did. This was the comparison between estimated and actual with a sample. The monthly report. So here's the um summary report this one i actually ran june to june so in 2024 you can see on the spending plan summary that the fiscal year fiscal year estimate corresponds with your estimate entered under the spending plan menu and then the month, June, is coming from, or is populating that from the monthly estimate. And then we know where the actual numbers come from. But so the estimates coming from the month and then the total when you're generating it six June to June. Now the next slide is what I was trying to show you live from 07 to 08. Um, so here's, with these parameters, this is what the spending plan summary generated. But to compare those numbers, I would run the cash summary report at the end of August, because this is gonna include the actual through the end of August. So you can see the fiscal year to date for July and August to be 710, which is up here. Oops, I'm sorry. And then 904 fiscal year to date expended can be seen by fiscal year, eight, year to date actual. So I just kind of, this is kind of confusing. And that's why I put both examples of where they're coming from and how to kind of tie it back to other reports. Any questions on this? And like I said, I tried to give you screenshots of different reports that may help um, along with the periodic reports and the cl clickable links are here. I did pull some of these like the anticipated revenues, appropriated amounts, I think I had a screenshot of this report. I had this, we generated the financial report by line number. So I, and then the three spending plan reports. So I just put that there as a reference that might help, but I'm surprised there's no questions because this is like once a year, Periodically, you guys use these reports. So if you think of any questions, don't hesitate to put in a ticket or let me know. Our next Fridays with Fiscal is 
uh, next Friday, and that's going to be an in-depth look at fiscal year and EMIS related information for USPS. So that should be another good deep dive if you would like to join us. And see no questions in the chat or on the speaking up. I hope you all have a great weekend and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have some chats. Oh, okay. No questions though. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend.